So welcome back. This is going to be our second and actually final screencast for Chapter 9. We are going to be looking at fermentation. Now I do want to remind students that we did make some changes to our rubric. So on the back of your rubric paper, please make sure that you have deleted all targets that deal with Section 9.2. Um, we dealt with the information in 9.1. We did a brief overview of the three processes of cell respiration, and now we're going to head directly into fermentation. Now, I am going to do a little bit of review before we actually talk about this process, but please, again, make sure that you did make the changes to your rubric. So as I had said when we started our screencast, that I wanted to make sure that we did a little bit of review from the information that we had covered back in section 9.1. So what you see on this screen is you see all three processes of cell respiration being represented. So the one on the far left is going to represent glycolysis. The one in the middle is going to represent the Krebs cycle. And the one on the right is going to represent ETC or the electron transport chain. Now please remember that glycolysis is considered anaerobic. Now remember anaerobic basically means without oxygen. So oxygen is not necessary for glycolysis to occur. The Krebs cycle and ETC, both of these are considered aerobic. Now that means that they do require oxygen, so oxygen is necessary for them to actually take place. Now when you talk about glycolysis, remember glycolysis will occur in the cytoplasm of the cell, and the Krebs and the ETC will occur in the mitochondrion. Now to be more specific, the Krebs cycle is going to occur in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion and the ETC is actually going to happen in the folds of the mitochondrion. Now the inner membrane of the mitochondrion is going to be referred to as the matrix. So the matrix is going to be the inside of the mitochondrion. That's where Krebs is going to happen. Now the folds that you see here are going to be referred to as the cristae of the mitochondrion. So again, Christe is going to be the fold, and that's where ETC is going to take place. Now, when you talk about glycolysis, which was the very first process in cell respiration, remember we started off with one molecule of glucose. And remember that glucose molecule had six carbons. We took that glucose molecule, we split it in two, and we produced pyruvic acid. Now remember, pyruvic acid only has three carbons, and we have two of those. Remember, we split the glucose into two three-carbon molecules. Now, during glycolysis, we're going to produce two ATP molecules, and we're also going to produce an electron carrier called NADH. Now, that NADH is going to carry high-energy electrons, which represents energy, and that energy is going to be carried over to the ETC on the far right-hand side. Now, the Products of glycolysis are going to be used to actually start the Krebs cycle. All right? And so when we get to the Krebs cycle, please remember that we are going to produce two ATPs as a result of this cycle. Now, in addition to the two ATPs, we're also going to produce molecules of CO2. So during Krebs is when CO2 is going to be produced. Now, we're also going to produce the electron carrier called NADH but we're going to produce a second electron carrier called FADH2. And again, these contain high energy electrons, which just like glycolysis, are going to be carried over to the ETC. Now, all of the energy found in these electron carriers are going to be used to produce the bulk of the ATP, which is found in ETC, which is going to be 32 ATP molecules. So that's where most of the ATP comes from. So the total number of ATPs being produced is going to be 36 ATPs. So again, two from glycolysis, two from Krebs, then of course the bulk being 32 from ETC. So all three of those numbers added together is going to give us about 36 molecules of ATP for the cell to be able to use. So in addition to discussing the three different processes that make up cell respiration, it's also really important for us to remember the relationship between photosynthesis 
end cell respiration. And the easiest way to look at that is to actually look at the chemical equations for each process. Remember photosynthesis is basically taking CO2, adding that to water, adding a little bit of light energy, and that's going to give us C6H12O6, which is going to re represent our glucose molecule, and of course it's going to give us a little bit of O2. All right? Now, if you think about the chemical equation that represents cell respiration, we're simply going to take everything that you see on the right-hand side here and move it over to the left. So we're going to take C6H12O6, combine that with a little bit of oxygen, that's going to end up giving us CO2 plus water and of course it's going to end up giving us energy because remember the purpose of cell respiration is to basically extract the energy from that food molecule so the food molecule in this case is going to be our glucose molecule All right. now if you look at the diagram on the left hand side you're going to notice that of course photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplast and in order for it to happen as we had said on the right that you need to have a source of CO2 you need to have a source of water then of course the source of light energy. Photosynthesis is going to take place, it's going to produce the organic molecule and in this case we're talking about glucose and of course it's going to produce O2. So during photosynthesis O2 is the waste product that we use and during cell respiration the waste product that we produce CO2 is going to be used by photosynthesis. Now remember the total amount of ATP that's being produced through this process of cell respiration is around 36 ATP. So we're extracting about 36 percent of the energy from that glucose molecule. So what we have still is we have about 64 percent of that energy left. Now in this case that 64 percent is going to be represented by heat energy. So that is an energy the cell can actually use but it is energy that the organism can actually use to keep itself warm. In other words, our body temperature, for example, is directly related to that 64% of heat energy that's being produced during cell respiration. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we consider some organisms that live on this planet live in environments that do not have access to oxygen. Now they still need to be able to produce ATP. Well, what they're going to do is they're going to carry out a special process called fermentation. And that fermentation is important because it's going to provide energy to make sure this process right here, glycolysis, continues to go. Now remember, we talked about cell respiration as having three different processes. The first one was glycolysis, the second was Krebs, and the third was ETC. But you can't carry out Krebs, you can't carry out ETC unless you have a source of oxygen. So these two processes are not possible for those types of organisms. But they can carry out glycolysis because remember glycolysis is considered anaerobic. And anaerobic basically means without oxygen. Right? So it can carry out glycolysis. But as I said, unless you have energy to keep this process going, um, the process basically stops. And so there are two different types of fermentation that will provide the energy necessary to keep glycolysis going. Now alcoholic fermentation on the left hand side is probably one that you guys are familiar with. Um, when you think about the production of things like beers and wines, um, when you think about yeast for example, they actually perform alcoholic fermentation. When you bake bread for example with yeast, they produce a gas, they produce CO2, and CO2 is produced during this type of fermentation. And that CO2 is necessary to make sure that our bread dough rises. Well, in addition to the CO2, it also produces the electron carrier NADH. And all of the high energy electrons that are being carried by this particular carrier are going to be taken right back up to glycolysis. And when you take them back up to glycolysis, that allows this process to continue to go so we can keep making ATP. Now lactic acid fermentation does exactly the same thing. It produces electron carriers. And again, you take the energy found in these electron carriers, you take it back up to glycolysis, and again, it can continue to produce ATP. Now remember, lactic acid fermentation is one we had talked about in class. We had talked about the lactic acid burn. If you exercise really, really hard for maybe the first minute or two, you feel that burn, 
That's the lactic acid being produced by your muscle cells. Now you can also think about lactic acid in terms of producing certain types of foods. Um, yogurts, for example, they are using certain types of bacteria that actually produce lactic acid. And that kind of gives that sort of sour or tart taste to some yogurts. So again, for those organisms that do not have oxygen in their environments, they're going to utilize fermentation to help to keep that glycolysis going to produce those ATPs. All right, so that's going to finish up our second and last screencast for Chapter 9. Please make sure that you have completed your screencast notes before you come to class.